Okay. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Professor Hisham Saeed. Uh, professor Hisham Saeed is a professor of internal medicine and nephrology at Shams University, and he is one of the best experts in the field of nephrology, especially hemodialysis. Uh, he will talk about a very important topic, uh, but in you, well, every day, there is a lot of, uh, lot of debate about everything. <laughs> it is the treatment of anemia and CKD uh, with stress on ESA and what is beyond. Uh, Insha'Allah, we will enjoy a very, a very excellent lecture by Dr. Professor Hisham. Father Professor Hisham. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Tamir. Uh, I understand uh, you are one of the pioneers in the field of nephrology and how it is difficult for me to present one of my talks in uh, one of the uh, high uh, uh, educational as well professors of uh, deep information and science. I wish also to welcome all my colleagues who are online and uh, are experts as well in the field. I wish that my talk can uh, to some extent satisfy your needs and apologize for any missing points because it is a huge talk. Uh, otherwise, the the, even the title is small, but it's beyond uh, thousands of uh, details. So I reduced my talk to fit for the time to only one test slide. It's usually to cover that uh, we need uh, more and more even the doubling. My talk will present it uh, by the first slide. And here is anemia management in TKD, ESA, and beyond. If you look to the ESA terminology, it will disappear a few years uh, later because there is introduction, introduction of a new molecule, which is hypoxia-inducible factor. So it is probably within the next year, we have uh, two terminology for the ESA to differentiate between that erythropoietin hormone replacement therapy and hypoxia-inducible factors, proline hydrocellase uh, inhibitors. So this is uh, my first uh, insight on the talk. ESA components has two components, one of the erythropoietin replacement and the other is the new uh, introduced molecule in the treatment of anemia. We will cover both of them. So the agenda will be covered here is the CKD and anemia, EPO function and EPO receptors Eporeceptor and soluble eporeceptors, controversy in optimum anemia management in CKD and the current guidelines with future guidelines, epotransfection and the production techniques, hypoxia inducible factors, physiological pharmacological function beyond even anemia treatment. And lastly, beyond ESA, we can discuss a lot of the L carnitine. B12, folic acid, and the other. If we look to the impact of chronic kidney disease and anemia with health-related quality of life and the complications of anemia in patients on dialysis and CKD from the multinational real-world data, you can find that lower hemoglobin levels worsen the impact of CKD, health-related quality of life, and are associated with lower work productivity in patients with CKD. The physical properties as well for patients with anemia and CKD, hallmarks of the uh, impaired of the physical activity, exercise tolerance, and monitoring and managing the daily life are impaired in patients with anemia and CKD. The controversy outcomes of anemia in U.S. with patients with chronic kidney disease is well known. On the other hand, the cause of anemia in CKD is multifactorial. We understand that decreased erythropoietin production. We understand as well the uremic inhibitors on the bone marrow and the red blood cell survival. We know that there may be as well Inflammation and hepcidin level is high. As well, sometimes in many patients, we can find occult blood in stools and GIT hemorrhage. 
in some sectors of patients with anemia and CKD, the cause of anemia is beyond the kidney. For example, multiple myelomas and polyclonal and monoclonal gammopathy. So this is one of the hidden cause of anemia that we have to search is the hemoglobin level is below the estimated GFR, uh, uh, for example, if you have estimated GFR uh, stage one or two and the patient is truly anemic, beyond we have to think about causes rather than uh, CKD and erythropoietin. In chronic severe anemia, the probability of heart failure is high. We have a lot of mechanism on that. We have the peripheral vasodilatation, decreased blood pressure, especially the diastolic pressure, increasing neurohormones, catecholamines, rest, and the others, decreased renal blood flow, so it is the vice circles, increase in salt and water retention, extracellular volume, plasma volume increase, and it ultimately left the ventricular hypertrophy and dysfunction. On the other hand, in patients with heart failure, has a chronic inflammatory disorder. So aggravating the anemia and aggravating the therapy with the resistance. So this is traditionally the flow chart for evaluation of the CKD patients with anemia. We have to determine the CKD stages. If we have a CKD below uh, uh, 3P and we have to check other causes of anemia rather than the kidney, we have to make a work up which is the iron deficiency have been treated first, and blood loss, hemoglobinopathies, vitamin B12, and folate should be suspected. And if this is iron deficiency, we have to treat the iron first before going into therapy. Anemia and iron deficiency, in other words, what is the outcome and the practice pattern study? It is unmeasured. Hemoglobin and the iron store are measured less frequently than per the guideline. And it is estimated that nearly half of patients did not discover in, they are anemic in the pre-dialysis stages with huge variability in between patients, in the percent of patients between the hemoglobin arrived. For example, you have a huge patient in the uh, below nine and up to uh, 13. So this is huge variation in the hemoglobin in the pre-dialysis stage. Whenever there is dialysis and the patient is anemic, it is a very painful dialysis because the patient will not tolerate huge anemia, difficulty in maintaining patients within a narrow hemoglobin range, and the tolerability and the variation of hemoglobin has a worsening outcome Appropriate administration of ESA with regard to safety and efficacy profile, monitoring frequently of homoglobin, cost effective, and improving the comorbidity. So patients who started hemodialysis with anemia usually are intolerable to the uh, treatment uh, of dialysis as frequent complications, heart failure, and higher mortality. So, Pre-dialysis in TKD anemia management program to be installed early. Erythropoietin is essential to the production of red blood cells because it's required for survival, proliferation, differentiation of erythroid progenitors, cells in the bone marrow. This is a basic. Human erythropoietin is 30 kilodalton glycoprotein composed of about 165 amino acid residues. The kidney are the primary, but not the only source of EPO. Its senses is controlled by hypoxia and deutable factor, and we will come to this slide in more detail. The hypoxia and deutable factor, naturally in physiology, will increase the production of the retropoietin whenever it passes through the renal tubules. And the renal tubules consume about 90% of the oxygen delivery to the kidneys during sodium reabsorption in the renal tubule. So the kidney tubule is very sensitive to hypoxia with the stimulation of retropoietin largely increased with hypoxia. 
The three main sources of apple production in mammals are the cerebral, the hepatic, and the kidney. All are in the same aligned, but the kidney is responsible for more than 80%, and the remaining part from the liver is increased in supraphysiological stimulation by hypoxia inducible factor for line hydroxylase inhibitor. <laughs> so, hepatic EBO can be upregulated by pharmacological treatment stabilization of hypoxia, but in normal physiological, the kidney is responsible for the major development and production of erythropoietin. So, regulation of endogenous erythropoietin gene transcription by oxygen selective hypoxia inducible factor pathway in the normal physiology during normoxemia. There is suppression of the proline hydroxylase enzyme, so hypoxia-inducible factor alpha is suppressed and it is degraded. However, in hypoxemic stages, there is high hypoxia-inducible factors production with inhibition of proline hydroxylase inhibitors, subsequently increasing in the gene transcriptions and the EPO production, which is stimulated by hypoxia when reaching the renal tubules. EPO as well has a pleiotropic effect on different other organs rather than the red blood cells. We have erythropoiesis, we have the brain protective against ischemia injury, which is a target nowadays for treatment by hypoxia inducible factor, come later. It can contain the vascular tool, inducida nitric oxide, the heart against ischemia, the myoplast wound healing, white fat protective obesity, and bone remodeling. So erythropoietin receptor are presented in many organs rather than the red blood cells in the bone marrow. It may have additional factors and additional effects. What is the aporeceptor and sonifol aporeceptor? Because it's a new insight for treatment and understanding that the rule beyond the erythropoiesis, the erythropoietin receptor is a member of type 1 cytokine receptor superfamily. In addition to the erythroid cells, there are other cell types that express the aporoceptor, as discussed, the heart, the kidneys, the brain, the liver, and others. Vascular endothelial cells, astrocytes, neurons, cardiac myocytes, retina, and others are also have the receptor. So we can expect that erythropoietin has a sophistiological control of this organ besides its hemopiosis effect. So the erythropoietin receptor, it controls the proliferation, maturation, and also survival of erythroid progenitor cells. Soluble aporoceptors is related to aporesistant in CKD. So if we have a soluble aporoceptor that attracts the erythropoietin molecule, we have dysfunctioning erythropoietin, even we can have high level of erythropoietin due to increasing of their soluble EBO receptor in the blood in patients with CKD. So EPO receptors beyond erythropoiosis can be functioning in the brain, in the heart improvement with association of decreased apoptotic cell death, as well in the kidney, and it's a protective effect with associated with a decrease in apoptosis and cell death. Erythropoietin, as well improving the memory, synaptic conductivity, neuroplasticity, proliferation, neurogenesis, and long-term potentiation. It has inhibitory effect on the inflammation, apoptosis, and oxidative stress. How it works, we have to is the function from the start of the uh, sequence of events with hypoxia. By one gram of oxygen can carry a significant number of molecules of oxygen. So if we have a chronic kidney disease with decreased production of erythropoietin, we can have an idea about the hypoxia that the tissue suffers. One of these factors is decreased red blood cell production. However, with hypoxic effect by low hemoglobin in CKD, 
all the organs suffer and stimulate in hypoxia related sequence of events and a very huge proliferation inflammatory cascades. What is the compensation of low hemoglobin? That's we, what we understand years before the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and shift into the right and the left and its affinity to the low oxygen tension example in high altitude. So whenever there is middle or lower range of the oxygen, increasing affinity of the hemoglobin inside the ripple up cell, and whenever there is plenty of oxygen, they can contain a lot of oxygen and deliver it to the tissue. What is the normal physiology in hypoxic state? They can compensate by more delivery of oxygen to hypoxic crown and cell. The mechanism of EPO production is related directly to the sodium reabsorption in renal tubules, where it consumes 90% of the oxygen delivered to the kidney. Whenever there is low hemoglobin and hypoxemia, it stimulates the EPO producing cells. However, in some cases of inflammation, the inflammatory cytokine has a both directional way. Number one, reducing the erythropoietin production. Number two, it has a huge suppressive effect on the bone marrow and the iron delivery. So in patients with septicemia and bacteremia or inflammatory reaction, we have a bidirectional inhibitory effect of the bone marrow and the EPO production from the kidney. The balance between hemoglobin and the treatment should be in a very narrow window because if we go above, for example, 20 grams per deciliter, we have major advanced cardiovascular events, thrombotic manifestation, panel in place, and if we have a lower target hemoglobin, we have more blood transfusion and impaired physical and quality of life. So this is a very narrow gap and window between the risk and the penalties. And it's completely individualized for each patient. The end point for treatment is the risk of mortality and the quality of life with progression of end stage kidney disease. Patients on dialysis may suffer from vascular access from poses. So it is a wisdom that to give the erythropoietin stimulating agent and the hypoxia inducible factor in a very narrow range of safety and efficacy. The proposed mechanism for cardiovascular events at higher target hemoglobin, increased blood viscosity, improved the platelet function, and more margination, thrombocytosis, as well hypertension with increased red blood cell volume. So the clinical implication, what is called and the process, it reproduces deficient native hormone if you are giving the erythropoietin variety, effective in most patients with tolerance. In most patients, 30 years of experience, IV administration invisible to hemodialysis patients, while uh, in CKD you are giving subcutaneously long-term cardiovascular events, ESA resistance, pure risk, cell ablesia, and others. Lessons from the clinical trial for the erythropoietin replacement is huge data on the internet. And the guidelines saying that it is between 10 and 12, which is the red zone and the gray zone of clear benefit with no evidence of risk. While increasing this level above 12 grams, there is increased risk without additional benefit. The patient will not get benefit if the homoglobin target higher than 12. So the risk is viscosity, hypertension, purit cell aplasia, and cancer. We'll discuss it in more detail in a few minutes. The benefit is important for tissue oxygenation, decrease inflammation directly and indirectly, mental performance, quality of life, and the fewer transfusions. So high, high dose ESA requirement among CKD participants 
was associated with elevated inflammatory biomarkers, which is the resistance to ESA function in the poor marrow and maturation of red blood cells, as well the soluble erythropoietin receptor as an inhibitor of erythropoietin. So this is my uh, first insight that of the erythropoietin molecule, erythropoietin receptor, and soluble erythropoietin receptor. What is the perspective for treatment? There is three hypoxia-inducible factors we'll discuss in detail in the second part of my talk as a global development program that has sought or will soon seek approval. That's why the ESA terminology may change during the following year into two parts, erythropoietin replacement therapy and hypoxia-inducible factors. In the DOPS and the other and the KDGO guidelines, it's 10 years without hearing from the KDGO on the anemia management. It is the same, just an, uh, summarizing that patients below 10 grams and above 12 grams should be considered that not uh, uh, fitting, either for uh, low hemoglobin level and higher hemoglobin level and the rest. That's why the uh, Last year, the controversy and optimal anemia management conclusion from kidney improving global outcome KDGO highlighted that we need an update for the anemia management. <laughs> and this re examination of previous recommendations in 2019, KDGO decided to convene controversies. Second controversy discussed more specifically related to ESA and the hypoxia inducible factor introduced recently to the market. So this is the uh, global and the scope of the work. They think that the terminology may be changed to erythropoietin hormone replacement therapy to distinguish from hypoxia inducible factor, which is under the ESA therapy, by the way, what are essential elements for treatment? Distinguish hard outcomes, irrigate outcomes, patient centered outcomes, complications, hospitalization, and cardiovascular risk. So we expected that within the following year that uh, KDGO will publish new guidelines. What is the route of ESA administration? What is preferred type with each patient? And what is the nature of hypoxia inducible factors? proline hydroxylase inhibitors and their strategy when to check from ESA to HEC and to the reverse and what is the dose we should uh, play on that. This is driving that higher hemoglobin is associated with development of complication. And if you look to the guidelines, all of them are uh, currently in the range between 10 and 12 grams per deciliter. While in our Egyptian guidelines that I was honored to be the editor of this guideline, we said clearly that patients' uh, hemoglobin should be between 10 and 11, looking for no more benefits for uh, above 11 and less complication and the cardiovascular risk thrombosis and other uh, strokes. Hyporesponsiveness we identified in our guidelines if you, the patient needs a protein dose subcutaneously more than 300 uh, international units per kg per week, or that protein dose more than 1.5 microgram per week, uh, per kg per week. And also, we identified the possible and the modifiable and potentially factors involved in ESA hyperresponsiveness, including uh, dialysis uh, adequacy, inflammation, malnutrition, deficiencies of iron, vitamin B12, folate, hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, and the use of free. What is the globin? You can see that from the graph, a huge variation in between patients on dialysis in the hemoglobin level between below nine and above 13. And most of the patients taking the ESA route by IV during dialysis, although it costs 25% more 
than the subcutaneous route, but for patient convenience route. The same in Canada, as well in the uh, uh, Gulf Corporations Council. So we have already huge variation between patients, homoglobin uh, on that. Coming to the next part, what is the role of erythropoietin stimulating agent in patients with TKD and cancer? A clinical approach. Persons with CKD with remote or active malignancy should receive the lowest ESA dose possible that achieve a maximum hemoglobin level of only 10. <laughs> so the first player comes to us in patients with malignancy giving ESA, we, we accept hemoglobin 10. Why we have a spread from ESA on that way? Let us look back to the pathology what happened during malignancy. Growing malignant cells develop extra manifestations, extra cells with consumption of the oxygen inside the malignant tumors. Subsequently, in order to achieve that and survival of cells in the malignant way, they produce a lot of angiogenesis substances that increase directly the blood supply. And this is the worst case if you are using ESA and HIF, they increase the angiogenesis by itself. And if you look in deeper that, malignant cells, HIF and ESA, introduce a metalloproteases that distract the extracellular matrix, increasing the vascular endothelial growth factors. And this vascular endothelial growth factor increasing the permeability of the endothelium. And this part is important for malignant dissemination. So we have two arms of the ESA and the HIV. In case of malignancy, they induce angiogenesis and they increase the vascular endothelial growth factor, making more dissemination of the malignancy. So ESA and cancer could increase the progression the question is yes, but with precautions to the type and the stages of the malignancy. The supraphysiologic homoglobin level are used in most clinical trials. The binding of able to macrophage as well can suppress nuclear factor kappa activation and the pro-inflammatory genes, resulting in an immunosuppressive effect. So using ESA directly and indirectly, can affect the prognosis of malignancy, especially if it's active. Besides that, it increases the thromboembolic events in cancer patients and induce huge angiogenesis that may increase the cancer dissemination. While in patients with CKD who has malignancy and anemia, we can follow this flow chart. So if the patient has no history of cancer, proceed regularly, but if the patient develops cancer, it depends on the hemoglobin level. If it is sharp drop of hemoglobin, give blood transfusion <clears throat> prior to ESA evaluation. But if the cancer is considered cured, consider continuing. If not to cure, follow goals for active cancer. Be aware that ESA may increase the progress and number two, the target homoglobin never be in malignancy above 10. The CMS Center for Medicare has applied a strict rule for that ESA is not beneficiary for most of the clinical condition because of the deleterious effect of ESA on the underlying disease or underlying increased risk of adverse effects related to ESA use. However, it is indicated in some malignancy, and it is not indicated in others. If you can see it, not indicated if we have a folate deficiency, B12 and iron, or in bleeding state, or it's related to myeloma, uh, uh, sorry, it is related to chronic myelogenous leukemia. The anemia of cancer is not related to cancer treatment and prophylactic use to prevent chemotherapy. While it's strictly indicated in some types, of myelosuppressive 
anti-cancer therapy. So any patient with cancer, when prescribing ESA, we should look carefully for the prognosis and the adverse events of ESA. To the other clinical practice, to the second complication of ESA is hypertension. And the atrial arterial hypertension induced by erythropoietin is a multifactorial. And just to summarize that, it is nearly most of patients develop hypertension beside one of the causes of hypertension in patients with CKD on dialysis. The mechanism related is due to many factors. One is increase in endothelial release, and number two is a decrease in endothelial nitric oxide production. So if we reduce nitric oxide production, increasing the systolic and the diastolic pressure, with no difference in blood pressure response between any or ether uh, type, either short acting or dark protein. So Sierra and dark protein and ether has the same mm -hmm. mechanism of hypertension and incidence, and it is related mainly to uh, effect of them on the decreasing in nitric, nitrous oxide and increasing in thrombopoxane we in the solene one wide affection directly related probably to the endothelial cells. In dialysis, intradiuretic hypertension is aggravated by administration of ESA during the dialysis. <coughs> so patients develop hypertension with ESA needs re-consulting uh, the dose and the uh, target homoglobin, and we can shift it to lower dose and giving more antihypertension. If other causes of hypertension is excluded, like salt and water retention, volume overload, and the other. What is the, the component EPO? How it's produced? We have to understand that as a nephrologist. You can have a small molecule drug in the thigh. You can have larger molecules in the thigh by uh, biology, and you can have uh, even immunoglobin therapy. And this is the functionality and the complexity. It's like a pie still. And if it's you have a large molecule, it's like a car, and you have a huge molecule and the functioning, it is like an aeroplane. The complexity of EPO formation is related to a terminology called transfection. And transfection is the human epigene or cloning DNA coding sequence are transfected into another eukaryotic cell. So let us see this, how it's produced and why we can find variations in the performance of some types biosimilar erythropoietin than others. Cloning of the gene inside eukaryotic cells in uh, erythropoietin uh, releasing cells, it is usually Chinese hamster cells, and this introduces the cloning gene inside these cells usually by lipids uh, or uh, other means of incorporation, and this lipid-based reagent introducing the gene inside, functionality then applied to the nucleus to produce the epigene. And the recormone or iprex are the same sequence, even the dark white are on the same way. However, after such a transfection procedure, you need a huge stages of purification. So on the uh, same side of production, if you are inducing the in mammalian cells like erythropoietin, it's usually the hamster ovarian cells. And if you are using transfection on the uh, bacterial release like growth hormone, calcitonin, and insulin. And both of them are called transfection of the gene inside eukaryotic cells. So the difference between current erythropoietin it is depending on the carbohydrate cell, the same amino acid sequence for uh, uh, erythropoietin alpha and beta, but it is different for darpoietin. The darpoietin or congeners of erythropoietin mutation has increased in, way, in size 37 uh, one, uh, kilodactyl and increased in the carbohydrate. Coming to the third part of my talk, what is the hypoxia-inducible factor activation? Three hypoxia-inducible factors 
Zaprodostat, Roxadostat, and Vadadostat, a global development program that have sought or will soon seek approval. How it was? Let us imagine where we are. If we are in a Boston, we are on the sea level, there is no hypoxia and oxygen tension is 20%. If you go up like Kimonex in France or Aspen in US or Mont Blanc in France, you got some oxygen, 11%. And if you go up higher like Everest, you have an oxygen content is only 7%. And this variation in the oxygen content and hypoxia is the huge stimulant of a hypoxia inducible factor, prolyl hydroxylase, that inhibits naturally the hypoxia inducible factor. Whenever there is hypoxia, there is increasing in the activity of prolyl hydroxylase inhibition, destruction is limited and increasing in hypoxia inducible factor molecules that induce the erythropoietin release from the kidney as well from the liver. The essential mediator of cellular oxygen signaling pathway, it is a thyroid transcription factor, oxygen sensitive molecule, which is the active molecule, the hypoxia inducible factor alpha. It can control as well what is called a uh, compensation of the hypoxic field into different other way, not only for erythropoiesis uh, production. It controls glucose uptake, metabolism, angiogenesis, <clears throat> erythropoiesis, cell proliferation, and apoptosis. So hypoxia induce larger amount of hypoxia inducible factors by inhibiting the prolyl hydroxylate, which naturally distracts the molecule. The erythrocytes and the other molecules can also <coughs> controlling the cytokines, lowering the hepatin, and improving in the iron absorption. Hypoxia inducible factor from theoretical to superiority to clinical non inferiority, we can find that. The new drugs of hypoxia inducible factor D that introduced in the market and launched in Japan, China, and some other countries can increase the production of internal erythropoietin directly from the kidney in the supraphysiologic dose as well from the liver and the other. However, it covered a huge metabolic control of other systems. Some of them are beneficial and open the door for new therapeutic challenges of the hypoxia inducible factors molecule for others. It's controlling the mitochondrial function, the angiogenesis, probably in ischemic skin and the others. The metabolic changes, the fat tissue, it inhibits the hepcidin and the inflammation pathway. It can improve the wound the healing and fibrosis. Be aware that increasing the erythropoiesis is one part of the big puzzle of his can do. While the kidney has a fibroplast like renal erythropoietin production in the supraphysiological doses, the EPO upon a second hypoxic stimulus. So the main function of his. <coughs> Tablets oral intake is increasing the erythropoietin production from the sleeping cells in the renal tubular paratubular cells. So treatment with HIF is stabilizing agents like ruxadistat re-induce hypoxypression in previously active rib cells of damaged kidney and CKD. Also, it's released from uh, the liver. And this is one of these, uh, on the left side, you can find that in normal oxymic state, there is hydroxylation by hip brolyl hydroxylase, so distracting the hypoxia inducible factor. However, if we go to hypoxic stage or the treatment with hip, which simulates the hypoxic stage, this enzyme is blocked, so increasing in hypoxia 
and inducible factors alpha and this transcript a lot of genes and this trumps are affecting one part is erythropoietin. However, increasing that has many functions as a normal physiological control of hypoxia, like exactly if you have been in the Everest mountain. If the uh, upregulate the receptor, increase intestinal iron absorption and transferrin uh, transporter uh, iron to transferrin receptor, iron is released from transferrin HIP as well upregulate the EPO receptors and endogenous <clears throat> EPO production. HIP upregulate transferrin receptor, increasing iron uptake by pro uh, uh, erythrocyte in the progenitor cells in the bone marrow and promote the formation of fully function mature erythroplasts. That's why, when in stimulating the hypoxia inducible factor, transcription gene, we have many functions. One of them is the erythropoiesis. However, angiogenesis is the mechanism of delivering more blood supply to hypoxic organs. So compensating for the hypoxia. Increasing the erythropoietin from the native damages chronic kidney disease in the supraphysiological volume of hypoxia inducible factor is probable. So his pH inhibitors are likely to become an important tool for anemia management in patients with CKD, improve erythrocytosis, increasing in the iron absorption and transfer, and decreasing in hip size and level. <clears throat> and it is uh, well documented in most of the studies that uh, it decreases the hepcidin, which is related to anemia hyperresponsiveness to ether. Other function besides erythropoiesis, it controls the inflammation, inflammatory markers, improving the EPO response, as well in improving the bone marrow uh, suppression by inflammation. In the immunity stages, HIF can also control the inflammation of the macrophage aggregation, even in infection is importantly, because when there is an infection, there is migration of macrophage and neutrophils from the bloodstream to the tissue, which is already hypoxic during infection. So migration and leaving the bloodstream from the blood to the inflamed part, like wounds and infection, the macrophage and neutrophils suffer from hypoxia. And here, the HIF molecule improves their function and improves their phagocytotic effect. The metabolites increasing in the glucose uptake by the GLUT1, increasing glycolysis. So it's considered that one of the uh, inflammatory mediators controlling the hypoxia, they can compensate, on the other hand, this process and improve the tissue oxygen and delivery of the uh, glucose. However, in cancer, as discussed previously, it is risky because it induced angiogenesis. In the bone marrow, it controls the common as well myeloid precursor cell and common lymphoid precursor cell with natural killer and lymphoplast production of antibodies. In few trials, Discussing the hypoxia inducible factors in inflammation and the both uh, uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, uh, this one, uh, few, very few slides discuss that, but it is a good insight to have an information on the reperfusion injury in the kidney and the brain, and this signaling that therapeutic approach uh, in mouse model of renal ischemia reperfusion injury is improve that. In diabetes, it resembles that diabetes and uh, uh, diabetic complications, because diabetes, especially in the kidney, <coughs> impaired due to insufficient activation of HIV signaling, which results from inhibition of HIV-1 alpha stability and function due to hyperglycemia and elevated fatty acid level. So this in diabetic kidney disease, it is one of the promising mechanisms that 
Because if you have a diabetes, you have impaired adaptive response, angiogenesis, glycolysis, migration, proliferation, and uh, cell survival, all these are decreased to in increasing in the mitochondrial uh, respiration. If you look to this very nice diagram, I, uh, I think it is concluded that embedded response to hypoxia in diabetes contribute to the development of diabetes and diabetic complication. Look for that impaired response to hypoxia. Let us rem reminding that one of the mechanisms of ischemic lesions in the renal tubules and fibrosis in the kidney is hypoxia. And why anemia can progress the CKD? Because the oxygen delivery to the renal tubule is affected and it is almost 90%. And with the expansion of the renal mesangial cells, we need more oxygen. That's why it properly, the <clears throat> new molecules of hypoxia-inducible factors can control or regress the damage of renal tubules by delivering more oxygen and the mesangial cells before uh, expansion to have uh, less fibrosis. So hypoxia and renal tubule is the driving force of tubular atrophy and the tissue fibrosis. Maybe uh, uh, both of sodium glucose co-transporter and the eighth synergistic effect on the sodium glucose co-transporter in renal tubules. And this may be an insight for new therapy in patients with diabetic kidney disease. It also controls metabolic disorders in type 2 diabetes. What about the literature? written in this field. The devil in the details. Mountain of information and knowledge. We need more data. We have different molecules. What is introduced in the market for the HIST is Dabrodostat, Roxadostat, and Vedadostat. They control the trial population in pre-dialysis population in incident dialysis and in prevalent dialysis population. <clears throat> we also compare the effect of ether erythropoietin directly like darcopoietin or recombinant erythropoietin in between them. In non-dialysis dependent CKD placebo control studies, it gives a beneficial effect to reach the target looking for the major advanced cardiovascular event, it does not differ significantly between HIF and ESA therapy, erythropoietin. In non biases dependent ESA controller studies, there is non-inferiority in production of hemoglobin, dabrosostat, roxadostat, and the vedadostat. And the efficacy in hemoglobin response is identical nearly of uh, the three types of the HIF molecules. In a stable dialysis uh, dependent uh, population, the treatment period for the post and the primary end point for both the major advanced major uh, cardiovascular uh, events, uh, MACE and the MACE plus, if you have heart failure, it shows that for example, the Rooksted state, improving the hemoglobin with decreasing the IV iron use. This is one of the beneficial effects of HIF molecules. It also decreases the HIF size level. So it could be of value in patients with hyperresponsiveness of erythropoietin due to inflammation. The complication and advanced uh, cardiovascular events are mostly are equivalent for uh, all groups. Additional endpoints are the same. We are looking for lower IV iron use. It decreases the LDL cholesterol uh, 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 changes. The uh, arterial blood pressure, it's a separation of hypertension is better. And uh, for all of uh, them, the benefit effect in ESA resistant inflammatory high hepcidin level. The complications were that the standard, the staple dialysis uh, dependent population and in, uh, incident dialysis dependent population, again, is DARPOVITIN 
and uh, erythropoietin alpha and beta are equivalent in that. So they are non inferior to the current uh, uh, ESA erythropoietin uh, uh, treatment and the major advantage uh, cardiovascular adverse cardiovascular events and the maze plus like heart failure are equivalent and not inferior to others with the hazard ratio usually in the same range between them. Even in patients with thrombosis, vascular access thrombosis, if we can have the roxadis fat, <laughs> the percent of vascular access thrombosis on the or thrombolic events are nearly are equivalent in both the groups. So the clinical pharmacokinetics, it could be taken orally. The plasma slice is around 16 hours. It's totally plasma binding, so it is not dialyzable. In many of the clinical researches discussing the efficacy, we, uh, they noted some of the complications of patients with the roxadistat <laughs> like unexplained uh, hyperkalemia. So we have to rethink about that in the mechanism of roxadistat and the effect of hyperkalemia. <laughs> Probably it is an observation rather than a tool, but however, uh, in uh, some studies and or in the frequent studies, we have to think if they have a direct rule of HIF and potassium uh, hemostasis. So this one of the studies are done in China and registered of the Aruxan state for uh, uh, many months of treatment comparing the placebo and Aruxan state and defining that patients with Aruxan uh, state is increasing in the change of the baseline of hemoglobin uh, <laughs> rather than the placebo and as well the uh, importantly in iron, uh, IV iron is decreased. But hyperkalemia is reasonably higher than in the uh, placebo as well, metabolic acidosis, and they probably it's an observation, not a direct uh, cause. Many studies are uh, for that recently published within the last uh, couple of years, controlling that in conclusion, both uh, HIF and ESA, like double stat or placebo, are effective in treatment. They increase the hemoglobin as the same way of retropoietin, but they decrease the h uh, level sharply. And in patients with high CRP, they were swollen, <clears throat> with uh, importantly decreasing inferritin and increasing the iron delivery to uh, the pomar. All of these are the same results and the same conclusion consistently in patients with uh, dialysis dependent and uh, uh, standard or stable and incident dialysis dependent has the same uh, way. Putting to that on the future, it may have a protective uh, against acute and chronic kidney disease, can prevent retinopathy prematurely or retinal detachment by angiogenesis, can be inhibitor of cardiovascular disease, accelerating bone and tender regeneration. I memorized that sodium glucose co-transporter when had been in, uh, introduced for glucose treatment, we are now treating patients with diabetic kidney disease and maybe uh, as well in synergistic effects with red, probably hypoxia inducible factor in the following <coughs> years may have as well a role on such a beast. Coming to the uh, few slides at the end, the dogma of additional treatment for anemia. It is a clinical life. We used a lot of dogma for treatment of anemia, including L-carnitine, folate, vitamin B12, and vitamin C. What is the rule? L-carnitine or levocarnitine is a small molecule produced by the kidney, and it is completely dialyzable. L-carnitine by enhancing mitochondria delivery of fatty acids in the mitochondria, so we uh, share the energy inside the cell. Also, L-carnitine uh, is dialyzable, it is 162 Dalton, and uh, it's a quantity amine that is not found, bound to albumin in plasma and is stored primarily in muscles. The mechanism of action of L-carnitine 
is it is just a shuttle for an introduction of the long chain fatty acid inside the cell, especially the muscles. First, carnitine replaces the CoA of the fatty acid, so transferring the fatty acid molecule inside the cell. <laughs> Once introduced inside the cell, it a uh, uh, carnitine transport. It gives the mitochondria the free fatty acid to be beta oxidation. The primary carnitine deficiency will induce non non acidotic and non uh, uh, hypoketotic. It's hypoketotic hypoglycemia <laughs> on the reverse of hyperketotic or diabetic uh, ketoacidosis. Failure to crave hypotonia because the muscle and cardiomyopathy possibility. It increased the ATP energy by the same way that it is just a shuttle to introduce fatty acid inside the mitochondrial matrix to produce the energy required. In hemodialysis patients, a lot of studies are conflicting studies. Some improve and some have no in meta-analysis. The present meta-analysis, some meta-analysis give the insight of beneficial effects and some others are not. Taking in consideration, there is no risk of taking L-carnitine, so it is our uh, clinical habit to prescribe L-carnitine in patients on dialysis because it is dialyzable and it improves the muscle uh, recovery and the patient properly may maintain uh, in patients with hyperresponsiveness to anemia and ESA may get benefit from L-carnitine uh, supplementation. A lot of studies on this way, and potentially ESA resistant anemia, cardiovascular disease, intradialytic hypotension, and in patients with muscle weakness. They are giving that to the horse because uh, the horses and the style L carnitine are important. Uh, definitely, you are not looking for our patient to be a horse. We need to live longer and stronger, and the potentiality of that can improve, but there is no conclusive data from each paper that, that the meta-analysis has different approach. Even they give that in 2003 uh, National Kidney Foundation, most notably ESA resistant anemia, and then in 2006, the updated National Kidney Foundation use of endocarnitine in the management of uh, anemia is of no value. And later on, the U.S. Center applied early carnitine for applied for patient on dialysis. And the both the rationale that the patient plasma free carnitine is low and have an ESA resistant anemia, and they give that by intravenous flow. So early carnitine in hemodialysis, even in the guideline, is not prescribed. Uh, more of that, as well others, like in vitamin C, it is not of value to give vitamin C, although it is dialyzable, but the patient can take its vitamin C deficiency by normal nutrition. My experience is that sometimes it helps in patients with hyperferritinemia and improving uh, of the uh, erythropoiosis in a very small dose because we know that vitamin C can induce oxalosis, but in a very small dose, like 500 milligrams every other day, most of the to my opinion, can get a uh, benefit. Vitamin B12 and the folic acid is still controversy. Folic acid, because it controls the homocysteine <laughs> level and the cardiovascular event, but even patients with folate uh, supplementation did not get of the benefit of that. So there is a strong inverse correlation between serum folate level and the plasma homocysteine not achieved well in patients on dialysis, and you usually need huge doses, given multivitamin, P6, P12, of no rationale in patients with CKD anemia. And coming to my last slide is the conclusion. Anemia management in pre diabetic <laughs> patients, we have to do a great attention and big challenge to overcome all the monitoring and the treatment option 
and pre diagnosed anemia at the start of dialysis is very painful and will have worst outcome. ESA, including EPO and hypoxia inducible factor, is a bi directional way of risk and benefit. Individualizing therapy is not weighing between anemia and thrombotic events. Not all patients are equal. We have to personalize everything. <laughs> patients are not twins, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Hashem, for your very excellent talk. As usual, we are enjoying every point. We're enjoying a lot of information. <laughs> you covered everything in the uh, management of anemia and CKD patients. Uh, uh, well, but I, if, if we one point here, but I would uh, I would like to add uh, in this uh, meeting because it is very important point, and the main the main indication for the uh, management of anemia is to relieve symptoms of anemia and also to minimize blood transfusion as, as we can. So it is, is, this is a clear message for all nephrologists working in dialysis units, please, for safe transplantation, you must avoid blood transfusion as possible as you can. And if you are obliged to give blood transfusion, can be given either with leukocytic filter, because leukocyte filter can decrease the allotransplantation HLA antibodies, and also can decrease the transmission of leukotropic viruses like uh, CMV and the Epstein-Barr virus, or you can you give a, a irradiated blood, which can decrease the proliferation of active uh, T cells. Uh, it is very important one to avoid blood transfusion, but if you will give, you can give blood transfusion, irradiated blood transfusion, or uh, with through leukocytic filter. And the second point, Dr. Shem, please, regarding uh, uh, hypoxia and usable factors, uh, what's your opinion regarding why it is up till now there is uh, if we, no FDA approval for uh, uh, these medications? It's approved in different cases. We understand that the FDA has a very long, long ways for approval. Uh, for example, if you can have the Chinese FDA, which is more difficult than US FDA, but approved in Japan have been approved. So it depends on the registry and the requirement and the possibility of introducing new molecules into the market needs a lot of force because up till now, we don't have the full clinical view of the benefits against the hazard of HIF. Yes, it is. it works on the same of the physiological way we understand. And it is normally uh, uh, produced by the body to control a lot of metabolism, but on the supraphysiological dose. Although the clinical trial had approved that, we uh, we will launch uh, HIF in Egypt by next year, uh, and I think it is as well uh, registered or on the registry way of many other Arab countries. So I think that uh, FDA will approve that uh, very soon. Okay, thank you, Professor Shan. And now it's open for discussion. Uh... Uh, we have uh, three questions on chat, uh, Dr. Hisham and Dr. Uh, Samir. The first oh, question is from Dr. Salahuddin Sharkawi. Uh, what's your recommendation for using abotherapy and end-stage renal disease and sickle cell disease? Sickle cell disease, you know that uh, sickle cell disease is ab the abnormal and it is uh, I think in Saudi Arabia has a lot of uh, patients with sickle disease. The problem with ESA in sickle cell disease, they already are prone for thrombo and polyp manifestation due to sickling. So I don't recommend it to mix up on that, if, especially if you have the homo target homoglobin, as Professor Samir said, that it is in the range of around 10 and the patient quality of life and physical performance is good. But it is risky. It is not written directly uh, in the... Uh, what had read uh, in the ESA uh, function and uh, problematic cases, but I think it is logic not to give ESA for patient with sickle and to treat the cause of sickling is the main factor, not to increase the production of a, a, a abnormal thromboembolic sickling cells. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hisham. We have another question from uh, Dr. Ahmed Yassin. Uh, IV versus subcutaneous uh, is a therapy. Okay. Uh, in most of cancers, in the analysis population, they are giving IV. 
because for more patient convenient way, just patient convenient, but it increased around 25% of the dose of cost. In Egypt, I don't recommend that because we are developing countries. So subcutaneous injection is not painful and they can decrease the dose and decrease the uh, uh, money spent on that uh, field. But in the majority of the DOPS country are giving now uh, uh, IV uh, EPO uh, therapy. On the past, IV EPO was not uh, prescribed because it gives some like flu-like uh, manifestation after injection. But rather right now, there is no like such a symptom. Uh, so it depends on the economics uh, of each country. I agree with the Professor Sham. Yes, and you say about 95% of patients uh, have receiving an EBO through IV, uh, uh, IV uh, but I am with the, the Professor Sham and the sub, uh, subcutaneous uh, EBO can decrease the dose by about 30%, which is beneficial. And also the incidence of hypertension together with the uh, subcutaneous administration because it will lead to a slowly increase in hemoglobin uh, so the instance of hypertension is, uh, is less with the sub-Q more than uh, IV. Exactly. We, we, can take, we can take some opinions with, uh, with professors. We have uh, Professor Dr. Manel, we have Professor Dr. Riyad Saeed, and others I'm not, uh, I'm not aware about who is online as well. So Professor Riyad is still if online. They can give us their uh, habits in Jordan on the ESA and uh, as well their uh, controversy of subcutaneous or IV in uh, Jordan. always, I think what we are using is subcutaneous for the sake of what you mentioned, hypertension, uh, rapid rise of serum creatinine, and also the economy. And that's really, again, we are developing, you know, developing countries now, so we have really with the limited resources, so we use subcutaneous treatments. Exactly, like in And Egypt. the target, yes, like what you really mentioned, the target usually correct the iron first, and don't start before you correct the iron. And we follow transparent saturation, basically, uh, we use it up to 30, we can push it up to 30, irrespective of the ferritin level, we don't rely really on ferritin level, treat yes. infection first, and that's what we do. And then you can continue. The target hemoglobin usually is uh, basically between 10 and 12, not to exceed 12, but any cost, you know, because of the what will happen from thrombotic events on the fistulas, hypertension, and the cardiovascular events. So the target not really to exceed 12 by all means. Exactly. We are here one, one gram lower in our guidelines. It's between 10 and 11, and I think 10 to 11 will, uh, will cover most of patients, especially the elderly or, or uh, in patients uh, who have a risk of cardiovascular events or uh, thrombolytic manifestations. Thank you very much, really Professor. Cut a, lot, cut a lot on our blood transfusion policy. We rarely use blood transfusion, especially in young individuals who are really candidates for kidney transplantation, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Manel uh, is with us. Dr. Manel? Uh, yes, Dr. Manel, uh, you can unmute yourself, please. Dr. Manel, thank you, Dr. Hisham and Dr. Samir. Dr. Manel, thank you. شكرا جزيلا على المحاضرة الجميلة طبعا كان معتاد يعني Thank you very much حضرتك بس كنت هسأل على السوبرا فيسيولوجيكال ريسبونس في حالات الهاف يعني ما حدش عارف السايد افكتس بتاعتهم اخبارهم ايه يعني لو فضل السيميوليشن على طول الهاف هيحصل ايه؟ Very good question because هاف could be both Uh, 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 it could be, and we can attack the HIV in some diseases, and we can promote the HIV in other diseases. So it could be a target, a target for immune, for example, if you have uh, autoimmune disorders, HIV may be a target for uh, treating, new treatment. But if you have an immunodeficiency uh, syndrome, or in some cases, 
in patients who need more uh, uh, oxygenation, like in diabetic kidney disease, written a warm dealing, it may be given. So still up till now, we, have, uh, we understand well how it works. But on the ground of the clinical trial, we need a lot of clinical trials. What's the message I say that it is up to this moment, all that literature says that it is not inferior to erythropoiety, non-inferior, but doesn't say that it's more superior uh, to ESA erythropoiety, except in one scenario, patient with high hepcidin, TRP high, and have hyper-responsiveness to ESA. So, so up to this moment, there is no clear indication away from erythropoiosis. We will learn from the next years on the clinical trial. Uh, Dr. Hisham, if you want paper, uh, uh, I, say, I, I don't know what is the explanation and the, the, the addition of antiplatelet agents uh, to the patients will decrease the incidence of hypertension in ESA treated patients from 60, about 60, 56% and the patient without antiplatelet to about 60% to only to patients antiplatelet. I don't know why. Uh, do you explanation for uh, Yes, yes, the, the mechanism of hypertension uh, with the erythropoietin is multifactorial. One is increasing viscosity, and the one is the increasing in the platelet function and aggregation. Also, hormonal level and increasing uh, of the endothelin one, and the decreasing in the others, like nitric oxide. So it affects the platelet already. High doses of erythropoietin increasing the platelet aggregation and the function even the number. So why not? We can try if there is no contraindication for uh, the, such uh, jasprin or aspirin used in pediatric dose. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Salem from Algeria. There is Algeria. question in your chat, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Salem from Algeria. He is asking about roxadostat and risk of tumor. Yes, risk of tumor, there is no de novo effect of uh, haste to, in, uh, to de novo tumors, even the erythropoietin. But if the patient has, as I highlighted that, if the patient has active tumor, we have to avoid the use of erythropoietin as well as the haste, because for their angiogenesis effect, vasoinducial growth factor uh, uh, stimulation and increasing the permeability, already the tumor are increasing its hypoxia inducible factor to compensate for the hypoxia inside the cells. And this is inside also directed in, 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 in just in thoughting that and or thinking about that in thoughts that cancer patient may be given because anti his because his is increased in cancer cells. So my short answer, if you have an active cancer patient, you need to consider that to avoid erythropoietin and hypoxia inducible factors, otherwise a complication may happen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hashem. Uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Zaid is asking about the ESA and the HEF therapy as a treatment of anemia and AKI, uh, your recommendations. There is no, there is no, uh, uh, there is no uh, randomized control trial to say that, but in the literature, Reperfusion injury in the AKI uh, is better, and uh, HIF can improve, improve the hypoxia induced in renal capules. As you know, that 90% of the oxygen consumption from the kidney are in the sodium reabsorption uh, renal tubular cells. So traditionally, if you ask my opinion, it is probable that HIF can have better outcome than others. Only very few slides that on animal model that it can control reperfusion injury in AKI. But on the table, I don't think that uh, we have a uh, randomized control trial between uh, HIF and uh, erythropoietin in acute kidney injury. What is important is the cytokines. And cytokines uh, and bacterial sepsis, definitely you need to uh, give HIF better than erythropoietin because it bypasses the uh, epsidin and cytokine effect and improving the uh, hemoglobin level. 
So why not to, if you have the plenty of HIFs and uh, erythropoietin, why not using HIFs probably and potentially is more favorable than erythropoietin itself. Uh, another okay. point, Dr. Isham, as a <coughs> point regarding the uh, with dialysis, there is loss of about one to two gram iron every year, about 100 to 200 milligram per month. Uh, so uh, this uh, this figure must be compensated by uh, by IV iron during dialysis. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, what I wanted to to say, and you must avoid the IV uh, iron presence of active infection or fungal infection and so on. Uh, but uh, you know that the uh, the oral uh, iron is effective in the case of uh, dialysis patients. Exactly. At what, at what level you will shift from, uh, what level of, of uh, GFR or creatinine, you will shift from oral iron therapy to IV. Okay, I didn't touch the iron therapy because it's covered before in CME by our colleague, Professor uh, Kamal Okasha. So I escaped all the iron and the iron module uh, and roots and the iron, iron type in treatment failing. But patients on dialysis, definitely, if they need an, uh, uh, iron, you will go to IV iron. Sometimes in patients not on dialysis and uh, not dialysis dependent and intolerant to uh, oral iron or have sometimes uh, oral iron can increase the microbiosis and increases the uh, a lot of uh, uh, stimulatory effect on the bacteria inside the colon. So if the patient is intolerant to oral iron and we need to move the iron fastly, we give short-term IV iron till compensation and uh, on that. There is no definite estimated GFR to give IV iron or not. We have to dialysis dependent or not dialysis dependent. Dialysis dependent almost all are IV iron if they are required. Non-dialysis dependent Almost all are on oral, except in few cases or few percent of patients who are need to raise rapidly or they are very intolerant to oral iron. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Mu'tasim. Still, there is a, a oh, question. Yeah. There is, is Professor it, uh, Dr. Saeed Khanis as well online. Dr. We Saeed? have uh, to hear Come from on. professional. Dr. Saeed. How are you, Dr. Sham? Thank you, Dr. Saeed. How are you, Dr. Samir? How are you all? Alhamdulillah, Dr. Saeed. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Professor Hisham, for this elegant presentation, as usual. Thank uh, you. Just I have to, uh, some questions regarding uh, HIF therapy. Uh, you said that there is uh, a relation between the HIF and the uh, intestinal absorption of iron. Uh, so this can open the door to give oral iron as a continuation to the question of Professor Samir to give oral iron to the dialysis patient uh, in place of the IV iron. And uh, consequently, this using HIF can lead to uh, decrease the uh, iron requirement in our patient. And this will be reflected positively on the outcome. As you know that uh, the cumulative dose, if it's high of the iron, it will be uh, reflected on the mortality and the morbidity. That is first question. Second question. Can I can I answer the first question yeah. because I will I will miss I will miss that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please. Uh, yes, it's, uh, theoretically yes, but on dialysis dependent patient, the route of IV iron is much easier. So why I give many pills for the patient and GIT upset. So in dialysis dependent, I have to go directly to IV iron, although the concept is good to give uh, an increase in the absorption. So I wouldn't give the patient oral iron and uh, we have the plenty of IV irons for the patient. Yes, yes. Uh, this is number one. Number two, definitely HIF improves the iron metabolism and decrease on all literature, has decreased the need for IV iron yes. to improve the hemoglobin. So this one of the superiority against erythropoietin that I talk is an usable factor decrease the serum iron, decrease the blood transfusion, as well decrease the need of IV iron against erythropoietin. Okay, thank you. Let us go to the other, the other extreme of our uh, hemoglobin, uh, what's called the naturally occurring high hemoglobin in our patient. You find some patients, uh, their hemoglobin is 14 or 15 without 
is uh, without anything. And you investigate if they have uh, sleep apnea, if they are obese, if they have granuloma, if they have polycystic. Sometimes you can't find any uh, apparent cause. Let us uh, manage these cases. Uh, some recommend if the hemoglobin between, for example, roughly, there is no evidence from the literature. Let us say if this for, from 14 to 16, they do vene section, I mean the physician, do vene section in the form of uh, discarding half of the extra corporeal circuit uh, precision. And if it is above 16 or 17, they uh, discard the whole circuit as a form of vene section, especially in the high risk patient for thromboembolic event like previous history of uh, thromboembolic stroke or DVT or what, something like that. Despite most of the literature, uh, they, uh, they are against the, the phobia from this high hemoglobin and the, there is no evidence that increase the thromboembolic events. What is your opinion? Uh, yes, uh, we, 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 see, we saw very few cases, uh, like exactly we said that patients on dialysis and they are doing dialysis and still the hemoglobin is very high beyond 30. You will not find a solution on a much controlled trial of thromboembolic manifestation because the case is, is very, very, very minute and very low finding on that on patient population on dialysis. What I believe it's correct, patient with high hemoglobin, either with dialysis or without dialysis, has the higher viscosity and the higher incidence of thromboembolic. Subsequently, we have to drop back the hemoglobin to within uh, a safe range by a venous section. That's my opinion, and don't have I don't have a reference for that because very very tiny number of uh, patients who can experience very high hemoglobin on that. But the route of treatment, I believe that it's okay. It's correct. Okay. Thank you, dear Prof. Thank you so much. And, thank you. And I think also we can add antiplatelets for those patients to avoid thromboembolic manifestation. I think it is important to add the antiplatelet uh, drugs for those patients. It might help. Yeah. Yeah. Might help. Yeah. Dry weight, dry weight will aggravate. If you uh, induce hypovolemia during dialysis, it will aggravate some thrombopolis because it's increasing in hematocrit markedly during dialysis. So adjusting the dry weight or giving the patient toward more hydration is better in this case. So we shall go back to your uh, last statement, personalize the treatment for each patient. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Amani Abdelgawad. She's asking about if the patient T-set is less than 20% and his serum ferritin is more than 800 and we can't identify the source of infection or inflammation. Can we give iron therapy? This is, this is our dogma in complications, which is the, uh, I don't touch the iron in uh, this talk, but you say that if you have a functional uh, iron uh, deficiency, you have a low T set and a high ferritin above 800. To my opinion, that if you have a, a sure that ferritin by other measurements like CRP and the other deficient has inflammation, you have to treat inflammation well, because if you don't treat inflammation, we have a catastrophic malnutrition, atherosclerosis, complex syndrome, and the other complication with cardiovascular risk and the cardiovascular uh, calcification. But if you don't find this very high ferritin uh, level and lower T set above uh, uh, 20 and ferritin above 800, you obey the rule of functional iron deficiency. Uh, and here, the, uh, the hypoxia inducible factor will be of great value uh, for the such patient's population. Uh, Professor Sham, before starting, I think before starting, uh, Lisa, our hypoxia inducible factors. I think we must we must search very very well about the occult inflammation, especially all occult osteomyelitis and so on, and all because this is the acute phase acute phase reaction. Reaction, sure. Ah yes, and there is a set. This is this is a marker of and could be marker of undernutrition. So we must we must solve these two problems. If we search for occult inflammation and we search for if the, uh, about uh, undernutrition. And if we solve both, yes, we can add uh, as the ESA agents or the uh, Treatment of the cause first, yes. 
Dr. Amr Halimi is asking about the onset of action of uh, HEF in comparison to ESA therapy. Yes, it's a rapid reaction from the literature. It is exactly the same. It's taken three times per week. Uh, and oral root uh, uh, way is exactly like in uh, erythropoietin treatment. Okay, and Dr. Salah from Bahrain is asking, is there a difference in using hemoglobin level pre-dialysis or post-dialysis to adjust the uh, EBO dose? Yes, you touch a, a whole point that, to my opinion against the guidelines. When to measure hemoglobin? If you are measuring hemoglobin post the dialysis, you can find it higher because there is normal volumia. And if you are measuring that pre-dialysis, especially on the weekend the dialysis, you will find lower by one or 1.5 gram. So what the guideline says that measure that in the midweek. So it is nearly between the normal volumic and slightly hypervolumic way. So uh, uh, the measurement of hemoglobin in the midweek session is better to be evaluated. Okay. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Professor Manali Deep is asking about does the concept of dead and use iron in infection is it still or changed? Uh, to my opinion, as uh, also confirmed by Professor Dr. Tamir, yes, I confirm that if your patient has current infection and you, the IV iron in, increase the uh, load and the decrease the macrophage phagocytotic function and they may impair immunity, especially that if you are, have a huge infection, IV iron will not work uh, that uh, to be translated to uh, red blood cells. So uh, I confirm that Professor Dr. Tamir that if we have a current infection, we have to avoid IV iron. Okay. Uh, the last question is from uh, Dr. Rola Othman. She is asking about as if affect ACE and ACE2 expression. Does it have a role in COVID? There is no uh, there is no explanation for that, but you are uh, giving both. If you are giving erythropoietin or uh, HIV in patients with hypercoagulative state of COVID, you have a multiple risk. So there is no, uh, to my reading, that correlation to give or not to give, but the logic thinking is not to give that uh, if patient has current COVID. But if the patient has no COVID, uh, 19 and not hypercoagulose. So this applies to all population uh, to give uh, his uh, as routinely exactly like erythropoietin up to this moment. Thank you, Dr. Hisham, and thank you, Dr. Samir. Thank you, Dr. Montafer. Thank you, Professor Hisham, for your uh, excellent talk. And uh, uh, inshallah, we hope to meet uh, very soon for another talk. Uh, because all your talks, as usual, covering every point in uh, your subject. Thank you thank again, you. Professor Hisham, for your talk. Thank you for all. Thank you. Good night. And thank you for all our colleagues for their, their, their very nice uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.